Thank you. Seven years ago today, I was headed to a hospital in Dallas. I was really nervous, I was really anxious, much more than I am right now, believe it or not, um, because I really wasn't sure what to expect when I got there. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to do when I got there. But I knew that I was headed into a facility that was going to be buzzing with a lot of activity and a lot of emotion. See, the day before, the first case of Ebola in the United States was diagnosed at that hospital. And on a conference call announcing that diagnosis, there's two things that I distinctly remember. The first thing that I remember is the sound of the healthcare workers who were caring for that patient, crying and sobbing. They were scared. W would this patient make it? Would they get Ebola? What else could they do to protect themselves from a disease, a very deadly disease, that they had never encountered before in their careers? Now, the other thing that I distinctly remember is an Ebola expert, very prominent expert. He was very concerned about the media attention that this case of Ebola was undoubtedly going to attract. And so he heard the question that the, the healthcare workers posed to him, what else could they do to protect themselves? But he wasn't really listening because he was so concerned about the media. And in that moment of uncertainty and a lot of emotions, the best advice he could give these healthcare workers was, you know what, this is not the time to get on Facebook. So these type of extreme emotions, these reactions, you know, in this case it was fear and ridicule, they're really not new to us in our pandemic world, right? Late last year, I was driving home. It was election time, right? There was a lot of campaign signs. Um, when I noticed this sign, it stood out. And again, here we see these extreme emotions, right? These extreme reactions. Just the act of putting out the sign, this very, you know, mocking, jeering sign, mocking the people who are perceived to be on the other side, who have relinquished everything to the almighty germ. And whether we like it or not, this sign really does illustrate um, very extreme views and different views, different ways of viewing disease spread. And I like to call these two different extreme views germ-focused and jeer-focused lenses. Now, the actions that we take to prevent disease spread, they are heavily influenced by these two lenses. So we have germ-focused actions, and we also have jeer-focused actions. And these actions have consequences. And these consequences typically lead to more disease spread or some other negative health outcome in our population. These consequences are infectious behavior, the sting of stigma, and the unvalued vulnerable. So infectious behavior is really about seeing what other people are doing, hearing what they're doing, and really jumping on that bandwagon. So when that case of Ebola was diagnosed in that hospital in, in Dallas, there was a lot of media attention. And part of that media coverage included people in the general public saying that they were going to refuse to get health care at that hospital. And so others saw this on the news, and they followed suit. In that month, emergency room visits fell by 25% at the hospital, and surgeries fell by over 50%. And again, that, that was really actions that came from that really germ-focused lens. And the, the truth is that that really had no impact on containing the spread of Ebola. Because of almost 200 people who were being monitored for possibly being exposed to Ebola, Ultimately, there were only three cases that were confirmed. The first in the original patient, and then two cases in nurses who took extensive care of that patient. See, the general, po the general public, they really weren't at risk of getting Ebola, but they did take a risk, and they were at risk for negative health outcomes by 
delaying care, not seeking care because of this, this case. And so, you know, when we think of now in our current COVID situation and in, in the great um, COVID mask debate, uh, really due to that jeer focused lens, a line has been drawn in the sand. And whichever side you're on, um, we really have chosen sides as a group. And really, that pressure to pick a side, it really didn't make a big difference on reducing the spread of COVID because between June of this year and September of this year, we saw a 500% increase in COVID cases. So the next consequence is the sting of stigma. So stigma is really all about discredit, disgrace, blame, and shame. Now, during the Ebola cluster in Dallas and our last pandemic, the flu pandemic of 2009, and in our current pandemic, those germ and jeer-focused lenses, they really resulted in actions of paranoia and prejudice against certain groups of people, Africans, Hispanics, and Asians. And really, these actions, they arose from these lenses, and they led to the, ero the erroneous belief that controlling, uh, controlling certain groups of people and distancing ourselves from certain groups of people would prevent disease spread. But in reality, no one likes the spotlight of shame and blame. And this kind of stigma really keeps people from, from seeking out care if they might be infected or they feel sick. And of course, that just leads to disease spread. The next consequence is the unvalued vulnerable. Now, when the pandemic first started, the, the population that was hardest hit was the aging population. And in particular, the aging population in nursing homes. Now, it's estimated that especially early in the pandemic, one in 10 nursing home residents died of COVID, making up one in three COVID deaths. Now, of course, actions were taken to control disease spread in this highly vulnerable population. But unfortunately, those actions came from a very germ-focused lens. And that really put a lot of stress on an already stressed system. And it prevented people from seeing and caring for their loved ones. So now this very vulnerable, vulnerable population felt very unvalued. Reports of abuse and neglect rose during COVID. There's, there's been a 15% increase in mortality and deaths outside of COVID deaths in nursing homes. Now, going back to the flu pandemic of 2009, that jeer-focused lens it really led to a lot of fraudulent actions, price gougings of medical supplies, and even fraudulent and counterfeit antiviral medications. And that was really preying on vulnerable populations. And it left some people without the means to protect themselves. And that possibly led to more infection and the spread of disease. So how do we overcome the consequences of the actions that come from germ and jeer focused lenses. Well, that really requires balance. It's kind of a sweet spot in the middle where we definitely need to have reverence for those germs that can have such devastating effects in our society, but also having advocacy for ourselves and for others. Now, this is where person-centered prevention exists. Now, these concepts of person-centered and prevention, they're not really new to healthcare, but they're likely new to many of us in terms of how we can apply these concepts in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's start with preventing disease, prevention. So preventing disease is different from controlling disease spread. See, controlling disease spread is about the now, the things that we're doing immediately to keep a germ from infecting us and infesting us from causing disability and death. But preventing disease spread, that's really about the future. It's about taking the lessons we've learned 
from controlling disease spread, what worked, what didn't work, and putting in place in a sustainable way in the long run for all. And this is when the, where the person comes in. So really, we can't prevent disease spread in the long term without putting the person in the center. We cannot forget the person in prevention. You know, so then the question really becomes, how do we consider our needs, values, and preferences, and those of us around us, to prevent those consequences that come from germ and geared focused lenses? Now, we as individuals, we can practice person-centered prevention. And all we have to do is remember this simple acronym, ASK. We just need to ask ourselves some basic questions when we're considering the actions that we're going to take to prevent disease spread for ourselves, but those around us. The first question we need to ask is, are we really accepting the situation for what it is, and are we taking proactive actions? I think it's important that we all, of course, accept that the pandemic has brought upon a lot of feelings of fear and stress and powerlessness, all of those feelings that result in that infectious behavior. And it's really important that we accept that we can't change everyone, their attitudes and their actions, but any change that is made, it really does take time. And there's always going to be some prevention actions that aren't going to be complied with by 100% uh, of people, but also taken to extreme by others. That we really need to accept. But we have to take proactive action in really developing, considering, and applying multiple layered prevention measures that are accessible to all. Because even though those individual prevention measures they're not followed by 100% of people 100% of the time, taken together, they really can get us closer to 100% protection. So don't let perfect be the enemy of good. The next set of questions we really need to ask ourselves is, are we seeking within ourselves and potentially contributing to that stigma? And if we see it in ourselves and others, are we speaking out against it? So Rachel Pearson, I just recently read an article from her, and she's a pediatric hospitalist. And in this article, she really talked about seeking out and you know, her journey of, of finding those feelings that can lead to stigma. She admits that it's really, really difficult not to blame the parents of unvaccinated hospitalized children infected with COVID that she sees on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, and she states, you know, I'm ashamed of that feeling, but there it is. So she speaks out against that, and she says that not only does recognizing this, this feeling and this emotion that she has that could potentially add to stigma, it really helps center her back to her values. It really helps her focus on providing consistent and kind and factual information and really focusing on that one parent and that one child, really focusing on their preferences and their values and their needs. Now, the last question we need to ask ourselves is, are we being kind? Kindness isn't something that really crosses our mind when we think about prevention actions, but it really is foundational. See, we need to be able to give a voice to the vulnerable if we are going to be successful at preventing disease spread. Now, there's been a lot of examples during this COVID pandemic where people all around us, they've gone above and beyond to help those people. And it could be something small like giving food to, to children who had to stay home because of school closures. Or even just writing a short note to a nursing home resident just to help a little bit with the loneliness. And of course, we all cheered on healthcare workers, first responders, teachers, and grocery clerks as they took risks for us all. Those are all expressions of kindness. We put ourselves in their place 
and we took actions to help them thrive. And this kind of kindness, it doesn't just apply during pandemics. It's something that you can think about in your day-to-day -day lives when you are considering these disease prevention things and for any kind of germ or bug. Now, I want to tell you the story behind this picture. So this is my daughter. She's six years old, and she's happily looking through the microscope that I gave her for Christmas. And I wanted to show you this picture of her happy at first because Unfortunately, on this particular Christmas, I was the root of a lot of unhappiness for her. See, what my daughter's looking at through that microscope are head lice. <laughs> a couple of nights before this particular Christmas, you know, it was busy as usual. There's people coming in and out of our house, kids spending the night, cousins started to come over. And I noticed her scratching her hair a little bit. I didn't think much of it. We were so busy, we were running around. I kept noticing it. So I, of course, did the hair check, and there they were. There they were, the lice. My immediate thoughts went to all of the people who had been in our house, all the kids who had spent the night, and all of the rounds of lice shampooing and knit combing that lay ahead of me. Oh my God, that was it. Christmas was ruined. Now my daughter, seeing my reaction to this, to the holiday, and seeing me try to gain control of the situation, I saw her lip begin to quiver. And I realized that I wasn't being very kind to one of the most important people in my life. You know, she's just a little girl. I need to put myself in her perspective and see things how she was seeing them. She didn't know what lice were. She didn't want Christmas to be ruined. So I had to reframe my thinking and have empathy for, for her. I gave her a hug, of course, and I explained to her that lice are no big deal. It's something that almost all kids get, and all we needed to do was use a special shampoo to make them go away. And it wasn't until she was in the right frame of mind that she was really able to accept the situation and the science for what it is, and the lice for what they were. They're just dead bugs under a microscope. And this is really where we are in this pandemic. We really need to be in the right frame of mind to accept the situation we're in and the science for what it is. See, if we look how things are going in this pandemic, after the availability of testing and vaccines and treatments, we still saw a spike in COVID cases. Now, all of these things, the testing, the vaccines, the treatments, they're all wonderful things, and they have made great impacts in reducing the spread of disease and deaths as well. But they're not a magic bullet. They're not a fix-all. Now, the scientists who spend their time predicting when we are going to see these types of spikes and how large they're going to be, they know that the one factor that is very, very difficult to predict, but nonetheless packs a major punch and disease spread, it's our individual behaviors. Because our individual behaviors, they create contagious communities that can either slow down the spread of disease or speed it up. And of course, asking yourself some basic questions, they're not the magic bullet either. But taken together with the tools science has given us, it can move the needle in the right direction in terms of this pandemic. So practice person-centered prevention. And remember that each step that you take when considering these prevention actions for yourself and those around you, they do make a big difference. And we always need to keep the person at the center because the ultimate goal of prevention actions is to protect people. Thank you very much.